Hello everyone, I'm Maluba from the OHCN. For Black History Month, I wanted to talk to a lot of people about what role they play in black health and what we need to do to improve the lives of black people living with HIV in Ontario and black people that are at risk for HIV. Today I'm joined by Dr. Dryden. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. So you actually live and work in Halifax? I do. I am a recent transplant. So up until April 30th of 2019, I just lived in the West End in Toronto, and now I'm in Halifax. Oh, what a change that was. It, it, you know what? It was a great change. I miss Toronto. Yeah. Halifax is a great place to be. Oh, awesome. So because you have that experience of being in Ontario, I notice you do travel a lot. You've been in, you're have been you going to BC, Halifax. What are you seeing that different provinces are doing? What do we all need to do nationally mm -hmm. together? What's the differences you're seeing? You know, um, I, I'm not sure if I have enough information to talk about the different regional experiences with black people, specifically around HIV mm -hmm. and um, health equity. What I have noticed through my research project, Got Blood to Give, which looks at blood donation, um, and the specifically with African Caribbean and black men who have sex with men, mm -hmm. um, cis trans men, gender nonconforming males, is um, part of that project we wanted to explore the use of HIV rapid testing, point of care testing. And that's when I started to notice the difference in access to testing across the various regions. So my project is in Halifax, Montreal, Toronto, and Ottawa. Um, in Montreal, there's in Quebec, in Quebec, the province of Quebec, there are um, provisions for HIV rapid testing, point of care testing. Mm -hmm. In Montreal, you need to uh, be a medical professional, a midwife, uh, whether you're in midwifery, a nurse, or a doctor. Those are the people who can um, administer the point of care test. In Nova Scotia, there aren't any provisions for point of care testing. So I had to get special permission to, to access point of care testing in Nova Scotia. And then again, uh, nurses needed to be trained. And so it's highly regulated. In Ontario, we have point of care testing. And for my project, we've, uh, um, uh, we've partnered with AC study and uh, we have peer testers. So we have people trained um, by the AIDS Bureau of Ontario uh, to give point of care testing, but also to do blood draws. And I have to say, having peers testing other peers with point of care, because it's such a yeah. accessible test to um, administer and engage. Um, and so what I noticed is where we have larger or smaller populations of black people and where we have different systems of healthcare, um, we have different access to the services we need and the testing we need so we can know our own status. And it's always important to know your status. Yes, right? always important. Mm -hmm. So you are the James R. Johnston Chair of Black Canadian Studies at Dalhousie University. What does that, what does a typical day look like for oh you? Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. So yes, I'm the James R. Johnson Chair in Black Canadian Studies in the Faculty of Medicine at Dalhousie University. I'm the fourth chair. And so uh, in 2021, the chair will um, have been in existence for 25 years. That's amazing. It is. So Dalhousie was the first university in Canada to actually have a research chair specifically committed to black studies. What's unique and what's, what remains unique about the Dal, this position at Dalhousie is that every person, every time this uh, position comes up uh, for a new person to sit in the chair, it changes faculties. Mm -hmm. So it started in the Faculty of Law, then went to the School of Social Work, um, then went to the Faculty of Arts, and now is in the Faculty of Medicine. And you don't see that in other chairs. Like, so there are other chairs of black studies across the country now, um, but they're usually just situated in one specific faculty. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, so I have the great, very great pleasure of being uh, the first person to hold this chair in black studies in the faculty of medicine, mm -hmm. right? Congratulations. And, you know, so uh, nowhere do we actually combine black studies with medicine. We often see these as right. one is scientific and therefore objective, and the other is only about humanities and social sciences. Right. So my work really looks at exploring not only how the histories of black people or how the histories of anti-black racism inform what we know today about medicine and science and health and wellness, but to push a bit, well, to push quite a bit, 
on making sure we have enough um, research data um, on the lives of black people in order to benefit um, to, to benefit and have greater access to, to health mm -hmm. services. Absolutely. And on that, I think that when we talk about anti-black racism, the discrimination black folks experience, people sometimes do say that has nothing to do with health or HIV or with testing. Right. And can you just talk about that and how all of that intersects? Right. Oh, my gosh. There's such a rich, terrible, terrible history of the ways in which anti-black racism have informed not only our health, but how we've even come to understand HIV and AIDS and transmission. And so... You know, there for a long time, you know, if we look through the periods of slavery, black people weren't even really thought of as people. Um, and therefore, we were often experimented upon, both in Canada and the United States, mm -hmm. without giving permissions, because again, they didn't think we were people who could give consent. Um, but And then also without any kind of pain medication, because they felt that since we weren't people, we didn't actually experience pain. Um, and we see that even today, where black people are often under um, medicated for pain for with this belief that black people just don't experience pain right and so what happened during slavery continues to manifest today in our experiences um, in terms of HIV and AIDS uh, at the beginning of the epidemic it was just believed that you know it was believed that African or Asian people carried naturally carried the HIV virus um, that and then it became African people just naturally you know yeah. have this and we're unable to manage our own health and wellness and well-being um, and we find that uh, uh, black people are, in, especially in terms of HIV and uh, AIDS, are often considered only when thinking about risk groups and rarely considered um, through intervention pieces yes. or um, as healthy people um, who, who have, you know, who can offer guidance and direction in terms of how we need to address yeah. HIV transmission and AIDS. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're often uh, positioned as people who need help and interventions as opposed to as leaders who have something to offer. Now, we know that. Yeah. We know we have a lot to offer. Um, but we're, we're rarely in the positions of decision making. And so we have to um, make the arguments about why we should be making the decisions for ourselves, by ourselves, and with our communities. Yeah, absolutely. And on that note, you were the first member of the OHTN <laughs> Research ACB Chair Program which is so exciting. You're under Dr. Laron Nelson. Yes. How was that experience for you? Uh, I, I really, really want to spend some time honoring Dr. Laron Nelson. He's a fabulous person. He's been a fabulous mentor and a fabulous friend. Um, you know, I reached out to him. He was like, I'm just, I was just thinking about you. We had an opportunity to speak. Um, and he has always been really supportive of me and my ideas and thoughts. You know what it's like when you're doing something, you're like, does this even make sense? Yes. Right? Yes. And um, Laron has a way of probing and asking you questions so you can help clarify better for yourself what you're doing. Yeah. The ACB, um, the, the ABC, ACB chair and that program allowed me to speak more confidently about my own research, um, helped me workshop my research project uh, for Canadian Blood Services, which ultimately got funded. And Congratulations. Thank you. So when I was at that, when I was meeting with all those fabulous people, I said, oh, I don't know. Should I do this? I'm just going to ask for this small pot of money. I remember the committee was like, Girl, ask for everything. <laughs> ask for it all. Yes. And, and then I did, and then I got it, and I was like, look what happened. Yes. But I know that I would not have been able to secure that grant mm -hmm. had it not been for Dr. Nelson and had it not been for that scholars network. Mm -hmm. Because um, just to sit around a table with other African Caribbean and black scholars committed to health research, research HIV research, and to our well being, they, they really. Um, they really allowed me to kind of come into my own and uh, be confident in the research that I'm doing because I'm doing blood donation, right? My yeah. work is in blood yeah. and it's an aspect of HIV and AIDS that we don't often see conversations in yeah. unless it's about, I'm afraid of being yeah. infected. <laughs> um, yeah. And so 
it's 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 an op it was an opportunity and an experience that I will always 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 have um, a deep feeling of gratitude for. It was fantastic. So glad to hear it. And you you did talk about that mentorship, getting that mm -hmm. from Dr. Nelson. And mm -hmm. now I know you're mentoring a lot of people as well. And I think that that's important for anybody in the sector to get that mentorship, but especially black people, yes. because we have that imposter syndrome yes. and all of these. So can you just talk about more about mentorship and what you're giving to your mentees now? Sure. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I'm, I host uh, these monthly chats called Chair Chats, um, as the James R. Johnson Chair, Chair mm -hmm. Chats, uh, with black medical students, black students in health professional programs, and black uh, graduate students. And I bring them together and I feed them because, you know, we all need some food. Yes. And, we, and there's some music playing. And I, I wanted to provide a space where folks, a, a safer space where folks felt like they could um, share with one another about what some of their experiences are, challenges are, could learn from one another. Um, and then I want, I also in that space really, um, uh, I'm committed to making sure that they know that they're as radical as they are, right? Like they are, like they're in medicine. Right, yes. they're in these other health professionals professions. They're in graduate school. None of these, and they're often maybe the only one or one of a handful of other Black people in mm -hmm. in their program, and that is always stressful. Microaggressions, all you know, outright racism, all of that. And I also want to focus on the intersections of our experience, and so I pay particular attention to those marginalized within our marginalization. So that's Black women, Black lesbians, uh, gay folks, um, trans folks, bi folks, uh, Black gender nonconforming folks, because I want to make sure that um, that we all know that as much as we may not be able to visualize ourselves in this work, that we can do this work. Mm -hmm. And so I encourage them to advocate for themselves. If you want something, go for it, try it, act on it. I will support you in any way that I can. Um, I have them do that with each other. I, I support them in their own writing. I support them in, you know, in their studying. And I support them with giving them or providing and sharing um, examples of other people who are doing this work, okay. right? And I think, because I think that's what we should yeah, do. And absolutely. they are, we, we, you know, they're brilliant, brilliant people, both in the university and outside of university. Mm -hmm. And if folks are interested in going to university, then we should really help support yeah, them in this absolutely. and then support them through that process because mm -hmm. it can be really alienating. Absolutely. Are you a hard professor? Are you a hard marker? Yes, that's what my students say. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> At least yeah. you're honest. Um, they, you know, they say that, but I believe, you know, I, m some of my best professors, and this is not always the case, but some of my best professors are the ones who were really um, what some would call very hard, but they were demanding yes. because they believed that we could manage the demands. Mm -hmm. And so my hope is that I'm demanding, but in a way that doesn't feel debilitating, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Or um, unmanageable, that I'm right. demanding in a way uh, you know, specifically for other black, you know, other black students, right? Mm -hmm. Where it could be like, we can do this work, mm -hmm. and we can do this work brilliantly. So. That, that's that's a real black woman answer. My, mo <laughs> my mom would always say, I'm expecting more from you. That's why I know you can do more. I know you can do more. Yes. That's, I know. What, you know, that's what my mother said to yeah. me, too. But listen, I bring food. Yeah. I will feed you. There's some music, you know. Yeah. Which is also, I know right. you cry and hear some food, baby. Yeah, exactly. This will make you feel better. <laughs> what exactly. can you tell us about the, da the data of black people and health? I mean, yeah. we know in Ontario, black people don't make up the majority of people, but but when it comes to HIV and AIDS, we're disproportionately yeah. risen. So. And and I would argue that that's the same across the board, across the country, okay. and, and 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 across North America. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean that we are we're quote unquote per, perhaps a, on average three percent of the population, mm -hmm. um, yet? as you just said, we are disproportionately higher in HIV transmission and HIV right. and AIDS. I, so we have that. People will often say, gosh, I wonder why that is, right? Mm -hmm. And then say, we need to teach black people more about getting tested. And we need to teach black people more about safer sex practices. And we need to teach, black, right? So they do this yeah. kind of development model right. where we assume that black people don't know how to care for their own health. Right. 
What I think we need to do is turn to the social determinants of health and apply that to why it is that black people are disproportionate in the stats around HIV and AIDS. Mm -hmm. So how does racism and specifically anti-black racism and colonialism exasperate our health outcomes? And unless we are willing to very seriously have that conversation around anti-black racism, HIV and transmission, then I'm not sure we're, we're going to be able to effectively change those numbers, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, living in nor nor North America, living in North America, um, living in a time what Sadia Hartman calls the afterlife of slavery, means that we, we significantly need to look at anti-black racism and how that even informs um, uh, why it is our transmission rates are higher. You know, black people need to see themselves, need to have physicians that look like themselves, yes. need to have nurses that look like themselves. If in Halifax, in Halifax, African Nova Scotians live in rural communities, right? They don't live in urban centers uh, to the same yes. percentage, right? Um, again, I'm new to African, I'm new to Nova Scotia, but what does it? What would it look like to actually have mobile healthcare that oh, went yes. to meet? black people in rural communities where we're living, right. and then have a more holistic um, type of health, um, health attention. Right. That could then, over a period of time, encourage people to know their status or that kind of thing. Right. And so what's happening in rural urban settings is not necessarily the same practices or interventions that would work in rural settings. Right, yeah. exactly. So it's Black History Month, yes, but of course, you know, we only get 29 days, so of mm -hmm. course we're, we're gonna take this off for take the year. <laughs> so I'm just wondering if you have any advice or lasting words for people in this work or in this passion yeah. um, about you know, the future of the year and what you're seeing um, mm -hmm. to do. Wow, huge question. Um, what would my advice be? Uh, take care of yourself. <laughs> um, make sure that we are fed and hydrated and that our own health and well-being, right, mm -hmm. is being managed because um, we need to make sure that we fully or as much as possible have all of our needs met in order for us to be able to meet other people's needs. Yeah. Um, and that way we get to expand greater amounts of people having health um, and wellness. Uh, Many people doing this work, there's so many, I have so many names in my head, so I'm not going to start calling them because I'll forget somebody, are already doing the line, the, this heavy lifting of making sure that decision makers understand the importance of anti-black racism when it comes to the barriers to ha health access, but when it also comes to understanding why HIV and AIDS are impacting our lives in the way that, in the way that it is. Um, and then my other piece is you know, uh, which is what I learned from the Scholars Network and which is what I learned from Dr. Leron Nelson, which is just, you know, keep plugging away, keep trying, try something new. Doesn't matter if it's not been done before. We, like they, we have a method. Uh, black people have our, have our research methods. Black people, we have our theory. Black people, we have our, um, have our analysis and we understand how to analyze. And so as long as we continue to embody that and embrace that without hesitation or without self-doubt, then we will continue to um, um, excel within our communities, for our communities, and by our communities. Yeah. Dr. Dryden, thank you so much thank for being you. here today. It was so great talking yeah, to you. <laughs> if you want to find out more about the OHTN ACB Research Chair Program, go to ohtn.on.ca. Thank you. <laughs>